Hi everyone, this is Brittany Bond, and welcome back to the podcast. So today I am recording this from a town called Ashland, Oregon, which apparently is another spiritual community. Um, I'm kind of on this like journey of just following exactly where my intuition is telling me to go. Um, and this podcast is going to be a lot about that, like family updates and what I believe is our soul mission here in the timeline and like how you can empower yourself as well. Hi everyone, this is Brittany Bond. <clears throat> Hi everyone, this is Brittany Bond, and welcome back to the podcast. Today's episode is going to be very raw and real because I don't know what the fuck is going on in my life, um, but I'm here for all of it, and I am following the intuit intuition and um, the universal flow of what is meant to happen. I'm completely in the trust that. Everything that is happening is working out for me, best case scenario. And also that everything's an opportunity for me to grow my consciousness and to stay in my center and, yeah, become a more full, authentic version of me. (laughs) With all of that being said, uh, it has been a rough couple of days for me emotionally. Uh, Yesterday, I hit this moment in the grocery store picking out oranges where I just like, I couldn't. I couldn't function anymore like I had hit capacity of just life (laughs) and I just like couldn't decide which orange I wanted to pick so my friend Will had to just like kind of take over (laughs) and just manage everything for the rest of the day because I just was like and we are done Brittany has done enough of what she can handle in one 24-hour period so if you're keeping updated on my story I um I came out here from Thailand to uh, go to Burning Man, which was epic adventure. I was trying to describe it to a friend yesterday on the phone, my friend Josh. And I was like, it's kind of like going to the moon for a week because literally it looks like you're on the moon because it's just in the middle of Nevada in the desert. And like suddenly there's a 70,000 people city that's being built overnight by hand. And the only way you can get across anywhere is like through bicycles. You're not allowed to have any cars or anything there. And um, and just the environment is just so <laughs> out of this world. And I have been in many different places where I've said, I feel like this is like on another planet. But Burning Man is, in, as far as my experience that I've ever had, is like the max of the max of <laughs> out of this world. Um, so... I went there for, I was in Burning Man in the whole experience for almost two weeks. And right after that, I had planned to go see all my family. And so I had messaged them before I went into Burning Man and like let them know that I was here in the States and that I'm excited to see them. And I shared in one of my previous podcasts that I I spoke to my dad for the first time in like over 10 years. And that was really beautiful because he was like, nice uh my dad and I haven't had the best relationship growing up and he was like super supportive he's like he knew what Burning Man was and he was like enjoy the enjoy Burning Man be safe have fun I'll see you when you come out and I was like wow this is really exciting um so then when I got out of Burning Man I went I went to a place called Nevada City which is where a lot of my friends go um it's kind of this conscious community uh, in the foothills of California and it's right on a river super beautiful nature I was like recharging there by the river with all my friends and also it's an hour and a half away from where I grew up like right outside Sacramento 
So um, I was kind of hanging out there waiting to get the call from my family to like um, to arrange like going to see them. So my dad and my sisters live in Sacramento and none of them answered. None of them were responding and I just kept calling, sending messages and I felt in this very big like energetic limbo and I was like asking you the universe for a sign and I'm like okay I'm here I am energetically available and open and like mind you like these are people my blood they're my blood family and also when I left the religion 10 years ago uh, they very much like cut me out of their life so they have not been very nice to me and um, you know told me back then that I was bad association and that you know they weren't gonna hang out with me and just kind of like you know like in a in a not a very soft way kind of just like you're not good enough to hang out with us that's basically the vibe that I got after I left the religion and um and still I'm here unconditional love and I've done years let me tell you years of therapy your family constellation psychedelics in order for me to be able to say, so it's not like an overnight thing that Brittany just woke up like this one day. Uh, No, I have done my work and I'm very proud of the fact that I've been able to get to a point where I am fully trust of the universe, God, source, that everything is happening for me and that everything is working out best case scenario, especially if I am able to stay in my center take a deep breath on that one. (laughs) Um, uh, Especially if I'm able to stay in my center and allow like the universal energy to go through and like just be in this knowingness that everything is working out for me as long as I stay positive and I'm just sharing this unconditional love. And that's really what I'm here for. Like I, I've made peace with myself, with my family. I have built what I call a chosen family which are really supportive people that are like parents, sisters, brothers all over the world. And they're all following my story very closely. I've been doing calls with them, voice messages. One of them, my friend Will, he's like my little brother. He's like drove all the way out from Salt Lake to pick me up in Reno, which is seven hours drive and then has taken me on this road trip just to be there with me and to go on the adventure of all of it and to support me like yesterday he really showed up for me I was just like I can't function anymore you know and he's just there just like quietly supportive divine masculine and for me this is what real family does they show up for you unconditionally they love you unconditionally and they they support you in a way that is actually supporting the person that you are authentically not the person that they want you to be, not the person that your religion says you should be, society, whatever. It's like, who is Brittany authentically? And who is she becoming? Like, who is the version of her that's more her that we can support her becoming? Like, these are the kind of people that are supporting this energy. I feel like I need to take a really big deep breath. So I invite you to do this with me. So anyways, my family, my dad and my sisters just like were not responding for days. And um, I did my best to stay in my center. I was like, okay, you know, start planning the rest of my family. My parents were born and raised in Oregon and they moved to California and had us. So all of my extended families in Oregon, my grandparents, all of them are still alive. I have aunts and uncles and cousins. Most of my cousins were, all of my family were raised Jehovah's Witness, um, like back to like great grandparents. So like four generations back, it's like in deep in my family, this religion. Um, about all, most of my cousins, I would say almost all of them that are raised with me, they also are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Only my sisters have stayed in the religion. And so they're, my cousins are really excited to see me. They live outside of Portland, around Portland area. And then, so some updates is like, I called... A woman, her name's Gail, who was like a godmother to me growing up. Like she was like in her 40s when I was 12. She's also in the religion. 
But she really showed up for me a lot. Like my family, my dad had cancer when I was young and there just lots of family dysfunction, abuse, things happening. And Gail like would pick me up from school and just hang out with me and be this like solid, um, just support network for me and was always super supportive and encouraging and like really saw me as a kid, you know, like she really like validated like who I was and who I was becoming. And I really needed that. I needed that external validation. And this is what I mean about like growing up in a solid community because the community that I grew up in within the religion for the most part was very supportive and it's just like normal people showing up for each other, like a real tribe. And Gail was one of these key people in my life that was like, you know, an auntie or a godmother, whatever you want to call it. But she was like this person, like I would go and like spend weekends with her when I was a teenager. And, and even after I, um, got married at 18, she came and like lived with me for a couple months, uh, when I moved to a different state and stuff like that. So super close, like family. So I called her like when I'm sitting there in these couple days, like waiting to see what I was having with my family. Cause I thought she was still in California, but she'd moved to Texas. And we had this really amazing talk where she was like, you know, I of course would love for you to be in the religion, but I love you unconditionally. And, um, you know, you're an adult, you can make your own decisions. Um, so I'm happy that like, as you know, we were sharing about our lives and I was telling her, cause they have this thing in the religion where they're like, they program you to believe that if you leave, you're, you're basically going to be like a prostitute or a drug dealer or just genuinely very deeply unhappy. Just like it is not possible to be happy if you're, if you leave the religion, this is what they program you. So like throughout the conversation, you know, with Gail, she's just like randomly like, but are you really happy? And I'm like, yes, Gail, I am thriving. I'm not only surviving, I'm thriving in my life. I am doing great. And she's like, oh, okay. And she even said like, it's very hard for me to like wrap my head around this, that you're like doing good because they really program you to believe this. And so the interesting thing is because this... I would call it brainwashing is so deep that like, if you leave, you're going to suffer. You're going to have this terrible life. What ends up happening for a lot of people who do leave the Jehovah's witness religion is that they actually create that reality. Like they actually are unhappy or because it's so deeply ingrained that if they leave, this is what's going to happen. And also because, you know, if like the religion is all encompassing. So it's like, it's your whole community. It's your whole, it's your whole network. It's all your family. And so when you leave, of course, it's natural to feel sad that like, you know, all these people are disconnecting from you. Um, but they would have you believe that's because, you know, your separation from God is actually what's causing your unhappiness. And that it only if you, when you come back to Jehovah, that's when you're really going to be able to feel good again. And so from them to have me as this like beacon of light of like, I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm thriving. I have my own connection to God, which is outside of a religion. I have my own personal sovereignty in the sense that like, I know that I have a direct source connection and it does not need to go through a religion. It does not need to go through middle age white men. It does not need for someone else to tell me whether I am good enough to have a connection to source, God, the universe. I know that I am. I know that I have this deep knowingness that everything is working out for me. I am fully supported, divinely protected, and on my own, like, universal path that is set out for me by my soul. Like, I am good. <laughs> and to have this energy, I think, like, shared with Gail, like, specifically, she was just like, whoa, you know, like, I don't really know how to process this. So anyways, that conversation was really nice. It made me feel good. And then I talked to my dad's parents, my grandparents, um, on my dad's side, and they live in Oregon and like the southern part of Oregon. And like, so I was just thinking, okay, if my dad and my sister don't answer that, I'm going to like message them and just make my way there. And so they call me back like right away. And they're just like, we're so excited to see you. It's been way too long. And like my grandparents are in their late eighties, you know, and my great, my grandmother had a fall recently and like, she's not doing very well health wise. And so I was like, okay, I really want to see her. I want to see her anyways, but also like specifically because, you know, you never know. I don't know the next time I'm going to be out here. And so that made me really happy because she was like, just let us know. Like, we'd love to see you. And so my 
my great grandfather on my dad's side, he, if you are American, you will understand what this means. Basically, he took the Oregon Trail, which is like this, it's this very famous thing, like back in the 1800s, where like, when people literally had like wagons, <laughs> um, they would like start in the south and like, Texas or Mississippi or Louisiana and they would take this trail that they called the Oregon Trail that would lead you all the way to Oregon but a lot of people died on this trail a lot of people got diseases or starved or you know whatever whatever and it's very ironic because in school growing up here in the states we had to play this educational video game called the Oregon Trail where you're trying to get your family to Oregon and they're always dying along the way like you know like getting bitten by a snake or or like you know running out of food and I was thinking but this was actually my grandparents, my great grandparents. Like, why are we playing this? Like, it's a, I don't know. Life is very weird and ironic. So, anyways, they took the Oregon Trail up there, and they bought this. My great grandfather Bond bought the side of a mountain, and so there's a bunch of houses there. And my great grandparents lived there till they passed away. And now my aunt, my my aunt and uncle live there on one of the houses. My grandparents live on the other. It's where my aunt is buried that I'm very very close with. Um, the one that died when I was 12 and she was like 32. Um, and I was like, I'm really excited to go see her grave and just like, you know, have some connection time with the land. And there's a reason why my soul chose to be born through this family lineage. And I'm here for all the healing and the connection and all of it, you know. Um, and I think it's important to say also that like, my grandparents on my dad's side were always like very much like acts of service love, not necessarily like words of affirmation love. Like, like we would spend summers with them and they would like take us on f nice things to do and like, you know, buy us candy. And just my, my, every morning I'd wake up and my grandma would have like fresh waffles and fruits and vegetables she got from the garden. And, you know, like always was like doing stuff for us, but never like very much like I love you. Or, you know, my grandma was the one that told me that like, oral sex is going to cause an STD. Like, you know, there was always these weird twisted things that were put into it. And when I got married, I remember my grandparents went to my older sister's wedding and like fully supported her marriage. And then I got married like very soon after that, like a couple months later, and they didn't come to my wedding and they gave me $50. And then my grandma told me to spend it on my parents. <laughs> like this is the kind of stuff with my grandparents where I just never really understood them. And also that my grandfather, um, he smoked cigarettes like almost all his life. And there was a time when in the religion, like in the seventies, when they realized cigarettes were actually bad for you, they made it so that if you, you had to stop smoking and if you kept smoking, then you would get like kicked out of the religion. Well, my grandfather didn't stop smoking. And so he got what's called disfellowship to where, you're, you know, you're not allowed to, sp to speak to this person. You're supposed to like kick them out. But like... <laughs> we would still go stay the summer with them while my grandfather was his fellowship. And like my, my grandma, everyone would act like everything's normal, you know? And I find this, this part is the biggest irony of all of this is the hypocrisy in all of it is that as a kid, we would all act like it was normal for my grandfather to be disfellowshipped, but within this context of them following all the stuff and then disconnecting from me, like when I left the religion, I'm not currently disfellowshipped. I'm just what they call inactive, which means like I, I was disfellowshipped and I got reinstated in the religion, but then I just chose to disconnect from the religion. So I'm not doing anything with it. But according to their terms, they can technically still talk to me. All of this is blah, 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 blah. But what I'm trying to say is like, none of it really makes any sense. <laughs> like when you would think about it. So anyways, uh, and then I talked to my mom. So I called my grandparents on my mom's side and I was like, left a message, gave them my current US number. And then like at like 1030 at night, I was like out listening to music with Will and suddenly I got a phone call from my mom. So I go outside and take it and we ended up talking on the phone for like an hour, <clears throat> which was like the longest we've talked and talked like in probably eight, eight years or more. And it was really beautiful. It was just like suddenly my mom was acting normal again. Like she was like super excited to see me and, you know, asking me when I'm coming to Oregon and like just how am I doing in general and that she missed me and almost like kind of like, why haven't you come to see me sooner? And I was like, mom, I called you. So 
it was, it was an opportunity for me to stay in my center because um, for many years, like, you know, I've been disconnected from my family for 10 years now, but for many years after, like when it first started happening, I would buy, when I, when I lived outside the country, uh, which was like for the last eight years, nine years, I would buy a Skype number, like a U.S. Skype number so that I could give them this number and they could call me on this number and it would be like a local phone call for them. So like I would always call like my sisters, my dad, my mom and be like, hey, this is my Skype number. You can call me anytime. I'm available. Like I would love to connect. So for many years, I pay for this and keep it just so that they had the opportunity to call me on like a local phone number and it wouldn't cost them anything and that like I was available. They never called me. And so after, I don't know, four years, five years of that, I just stopped paying for it because I was like, okay, like, I guess they don't want to contact me in this way. And, and so to have my mom be like, why didn't you try harder to be connected? And I was like, mom, I have done so much. I'm literally here on this. I came from across the world from Thailand to come and see you and be on this trip and you have done nothing to be supportive if anything every time I reach out you just quote scriptures and tell me that I'm not good enough just for being myself that I need to be in this religion in order for me to be acceptable to you and like somehow I feel like I got through to her because I was also sharing with her I, I was hanging out with my friend Isa, and Isa was also raised a Jehovah's Witness so I was hanging out with her in Nevada City she's one of my best friends we went through all of lockdown together on the island in Copenhagen and when we were on Kopanyang together during lockdown, we actually got our moms on a Zoom call. So both our moms are Jehovah's Witnesses, like very active. And all four of us got on a Zoom call together because my mom at the time was being really like emotionally abusive towards me and just like being super mean to me just because I wasn't in the religion. And uh, Isa's mom has always, she's Spanish. She's got that warmth, you know, the Spanish connection. She's Mexican. And she... So I was trying to see if like Isa's mom could soften my mom and like help her to understand that like, you know, Jesus actually wants us to show unconditional love and be nice and not like be abusive to your daughter just because she's not in the religion. And so they had a couple like calls, even one on one, like our moms did. So anyways, my mom knows Isa's mom. And I was sharing with her on the phone the other day when we were talking to her, I was like, you know, like. Isa is also not in the religion and her mom like took her to Costa Rica a couple months ago and is fully supportive of her life and loves her unconditionally and like Isa's mom is very active in the religion and you know is but is also super supportive of Isa and is always showing up for her as a mom kind of like this is what you could have been doing the whole time and my mom was like oh so you know, is that what you wanted? I was like, of course, that's what I wanted. What? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, like, what reality am I living in? Like, did I just choose the timeline where everything's upside down? <laughs> you know, like stranger things, like the upside down world. That's how I feel sometimes with my family. I'm like, are we on the same war dimension or like, is everything flipped? <laughs> you know, like, did I miss something here? And um, the last time that my mom and I spoke, like I call her every year and leave a message. And this last year when I called her, which was probably like three months ago, four months ago, I, I gave her my email address in case she wanted to write, like connect with me back. And she did email me, but it got, again, very like downhill very fast where she was just like, you know, scriptures, sending me scriptures and, you know, this and that. And I just said to her, I was like, you know what, mom, I want you to know that I forgive you for everything. I love you unconditionally. And like, I'm always here to connect. That was like the last time we spoke on through email. So that was the last time we spoke. So to have this conversation on the phone where she's being super nice and normal and like acting like none of this happened was also very like confusing for me. And I was, again, doing my best to stay in my center. And also just, you know, sometimes I just realized that like our parents, like our generation is really is really healing the timeline. It's healing like this gener gen generational like lineage for our families. Like we are choosing to learn all these tools, like energy tools, emotional regulation tools, and just in general, like, like spiritual tools basically to heal our family lineage. And sometimes when I'm talking to my family, I'm like, I feel like I'm the parent, you know, like I'm just like, okay, 
this is what we need to do. Here's an emotional tool. Here's how to handle this. Because my mom was like, so in the email, why did you say that you forgave me? And I was like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> like, I have to explain this? And she's like, yeah, I don't understand what I have to be forgiven for. Like, I know I did the best I could as your mom. And I still feel guilty for some things that happened growing up. But like, and I was like, mom, I, we haven't spoken in almost 10 years, you know, like, there is so many times that I wanted to share things with you. There are so many times I wanted to call you and like, ask for your advice, or like, just like connect with you and tell you what's going on in my day, just like simple things. There's so many times I wanted to call you and like, ask you for a recipe, you know, like just like mom things. And you're just like not there. <laughs> and this is also when I was sharing about like Isa and like her mom. It's like just because you're in this religion, you're devoted to your God and like your Bible principles, that doesn't negate the fact that you're still a mother. Like you're always going to be my mom. And she was like, oh. And I think it's the first time she actually understood it from my side. And she's like, that must have been really hard for you that you were so alone. And I was like, yeah, mom. Like sometimes when I share with people my story, I've had people tell me that they're surprised I haven't killed myself. And she was just like, oh, I'm really. <clears throat> and then she said, I'm really, really sorry. And. that uh that meant a lot to me um and I was crying and she was crying and I told her I was like I still I I mean it like I already forgave you you know I love you and I'm still here I'm literally driving up to see you I came from across the world because I love you and yeah so that was really beautiful <laughs> Uh, and my mom's sharing that she's been having some health problems. And this is the thing, like, I'm not going to go into her health problems, it's her stuff. But the thing that I noticed was that she has a very hard time sharing about her feelings around the health problems. Because they're making it so that she is not as free as she's able to be. She needs help from people. There's some uncertainty around the healthcare treatment, like all this stuff. And I asked her, I said, how are you feeling about it? And she's like oh, I don't want to share about that, you know, or like, I'm just, I'm getting by. And I'm like, mom, give me an emotion. How are you feeling? And she's like, I don't want to burden you. And then I just had this like click, 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 click moment where I was like, mom, is this how you were with us growing up? Like when we were having a hard time, like were we able to share about our emotions safely with you? And she was like, she like paused for a second. And she's like, well, you know, your dad and I didn't really know how to do that. And I was like, oh, okay, so this makes me make everything make more sense because I had to learn all of these tools from like scratch, you know, like my emotional capacity and like hosting people and creating safe spaces. All of this stemmed from me not having this growing up. But there's something that clicked in my brain during this conversation with my mother where I had a lot more compassion for myself because the way that she was talking to herself, it was like how I used to talk to myself before I learned these tools. And it wasn't very nice, you know, it wasn't very gentle. And even now, like when I'm in a relationship with someone and I get triggered, like say I have a partnership and someone's asked me, how are you feeling? There's sometimes it's really hard for me to share and be vulnerable because growing up, it was seen as this sign of weakness and there wasn't a safe space. It wasn't like you know, vulnerability wasn't seen as a form of connection. It was seen as a form of actually disconnection because that's what would happen is I would share my feelings with my parents and then they would pull back and disconnect. And so then I wouldn't share my feelings because I, I wanted to stay close to them. I wanted, I wanted them to love me. And so I'm like on the side of the street in Nevada city on the main street and there's like blues music playing nearby. And I'm just sitting there sharing with my mom. It's okay to share your feelings with me, mom. It's a safe space it actually brings more connection between us. And I love you for sharing your feelings. 
And I'm like, I'm literally here teaching my mom emotional tools that I wish that she had taught me, you know, and this is what I mean by like, we are here healing our family lineage in whatever way, like maybe you don't have as much of a uh, a dysfunctional family as I do, but I feel like everyone has some sort of dysfunction in their family and we're all just doing the best we can with what we have. So anyways, um, so she's excited to see me and then, <laughs> so I went to bed that night, like really happy and like just kind of in shock, but like in this happy shock of like, wow, you know, like I felt in some way that like I was like coming home to my body like landing in my body of just like, you know, these stories that we create of like, why is our family disconnecting from me? Like, why, what is, what's wrong with me? You know, and then it's just realizing like, oh, my, my family's just doing the best they can, you know, and they like love me so much and they're just all just, you know, dysfunctional. <laughs> and, and I say that in the nicest way, like they're all doing the best they can with what they have, but it's like, when you're a kid or you're a young adult and like these kind of things happen within your family, like where they disconnect from you, it's very easy to create these stories that there's something wrong with me, you know, like that somehow there's this like a bigger picture that they know more than me. And somehow like I haven't caught up to what's happening. And when I realized, oh no, my parents are just like literally, you know, they were like wounded children having children. Like they were just doing the best they could with the tools that they had. And there is no like bigger picture here. No one's like manipulating the situation or trying to be mean to me. They're just imperfect people who do love me a lot and are just, yeah, just trying to get by in their own way. It's like takes a lot of like this like malicious energy that I thought was there and like this negativity out. And it's just, I have so much more compassion for my family that they're like, you know, most of my family were born into this religion and they're just like, this is just what we're, we know. And this is what our, what's accepted. And this is how we get by. And we're just doing what we can to, you know, feel connected and loved within our community. Um, anyways, so I wake up yesterday morning and I receive an email from Gail, who is like the woman I was telling you that was kind of like an auntie or godmother to me. And she tells me, like, uh, I still love you. And I know this is going to be hard for you to hear, but um, I felt into it and I don't agree with your life decisions by not, you know, you not being part of the religion. And I can't, I can't be in your life. And I was like, I just messaged her back and I was like, I love you unconditionally. And also, this is really important for me, for me to have said because um, in the past I would be very passive and just be like, okay, you know, like this like wounded deer, like, hmm why don't they love me? And now I'm like, no, I actually have a supportive network. You know, I have standards of how I will choose to be receiving love. So I emailed her back and I was like, I love you unconditionally. I'm always here. And also I have standards of how I choose to receive love and support. And like, I already have this huge soul family across the world and they are loving and supporting in a, of me being my authentic self. And that is my standard. And so it's okay if you don't meet that standard, I will always love you. And I'll always be here to share love with you and to love you unconditionally for your authentic self. And that's okay if that means you choosing your religion and all this. And I was like, I will always still like really appreciate how much you showed up for me growing up and all the love that you shared with me. So like, thank you, you know, because I think it's really important to have this unconditional love and also have these standards. You know, it's kind of like this boundary of like, this is like, this is the game we're going to play if you're going to interact with me. So um, in the past, when I was wanting to connect with my family, it was almost like the wounded child of me being like, please love me, please love me, please accept me. It's like now I'm like, I am the empowered adult, the sovereign being who's like, I love myself so much. I love my authentic self unconditionally. And this is my standard of how I will allow someone to interact with me. So you know, meet the standard and we can play on this level and I'm excited. And if you don't meet the standard, I love you unconditionally and I separate with love. So of course I still had feelings about it. You know, I was like, okay. And then <laughs> I get a, we're like driving to the town uh, in the morning to get breakfast. And like, I get a voice message from my older sister who up until this point has not like ever since I got to the States, 
I've messaged her and called her and she hasn't responded. And she sends me this voice message that is literally sounds like she's like reading a script. And it's like, you know, I love you, uh, but you know, you are not part of the religion. And so therefore you're bad association and I can't hang out with you. Um, and you know, I totally honor it. Like, I'm just like, okay. And I said to her, like, the only reason why I'd be bad association if, is if I'm trying to like convert you to my lifestyle and I'm not, I'm just here to share some love with you, catch up and like, I'll be on my way. Um, so I was like, if you want to hang out in that context, that's great. And also if you don't want to, I understand, you know, but she also shared with me like how her husband and her kids are doing and that made me feel good. And I just, I'm just happy to know she's doing good. You know, I just love her so much. Um, and then we started driving. So my dad and my sister, my younger sister never responded. So I was like, okay, um, I think they're just, I don't know. I don't like, I can't speak to them because they have not answered, but I assume I know that they have received all my messages. And so I was like, okay, time to move on. Maybe it's like not divinely a timed right, that timing right now to meet up with them. So we start driving. Will and I start driving to um, to Oregon to see my grandparents, my dad's parents. And we're like two hours away from where they where they live. And I receive a text message from my grandmother who says, which says like, I can no longer meet up with you. And I was like, okay, this is, this is, again, this is all within 24 hours. Like, I'm just like, okay. Uh, I'm like, stay in your center. And so I just messaged back. I was like, okay, I love you unconditionally. And again, kind of the same thing. Like, I'm just here to share love. I'm not trying to like convert you to doing my lifestyle. I just want to share some hugs and love. And she was just like, she wrote something back like, um, if you come back to Jehovah, we can share love or something. And I was like, I wrote back like, uh, I am fully supported by God and I'm already, it's just something like you can be in his arms again. And I was like, I'm already in his arms. I'm already fully supported. Like I'm good, you know? Um, and this is kind of slowly where I hit this like overwhelm point of just like, what am I doing here? You know, like, what am I meant to be doing here? Like, am I on the right path? Am I meant to be doing all this stuff with my family? <sighs> and I know that I am. I know that, like, no matter what they react with, this is very activating for them. Like, I'm like this person who they were super mean to 10 years ago and, like, you know, disconnected from just because I left their religion. And I'm still here. I'm like, I love you. I want to hang out. Let's Let's hang out. I want to share love. And, you know, they are choosing to respond this way again, and that's okay, but it's like this activation point for them. And this, this is also their soul's opportunity for growth. Like, are they actually going to follow Bible principles and show unconditional love? Or are they going to follow the religion and the programming that has been put on them? And I talked to a really good friend of mine, Daria, who um, was also raised in you know, around some of this type of dynamics and something that she shared with me that I found super interesting was she was like, you know, Brittany, you have chosen personal sovereignty, which for most people in the world, they actually don't know what that means because most people are uh, living by some sort of, um, like giving up their empowerment and their, and their, basically their personal power in exchange for connection to a society, a religion, a family. So basically not choosing to give up their authenticity in some way in order to receive this connection. And for me, personal sovereignty and my own like empowerment and my authenticity, my personal authenticity is the most important thing for, it's like the foundation for everything I do. Uh, beyond that like that needs to be there otherwise I am not good and so she was saying like within the religious dynamics of my family like they have chosen to give up their personal sovereignty and like their basically their allegiance is to the religion over anything that they personally want and so she was like you know when they initially she's like this is why they initially are saying yes because they actually that is a personal sovereign choice like that's actually what they want to do they want to hang out with you they love you they want to you know connect and hug and go deep together like this is your family this is natural this is the primal thing to do 
And then the religious programming takes over. And this is why a couple days later, you know, you usually get this call of like, actually, no, I can't. And it's because their sovereignty, their allegiance, they have given their power over to the religion, you know. And I was like, wow, that's so interesting because it, for, it makes total sense, you know, because in my head I was like, where is all this flip-flopping coming from? Like, if you don't want to see me, that's fine, you know, but why are they so nice to me initially and so warm and loving and you know like of course we want to see oh my gosh I'm so excited and then like get this like cold text message the next day of just like we can no longer meet with you <laughs> and she was saying my friend was saying like it's probably because they're worried that's like enormous amount of fear that the religion like puts on them of you know uh, judgment of you know consequences from the religion or literal programming that like God's gonna like have some consequences for them or something you know like but all of it is sparked by fear so in life we have this huge choice of like are we going to make decisions out of love or out of fear in response to love um or out of fear and this is something that like I think everyone needs to look at like are like are you making your choices today because you are in a place of unconditional love with yourself love towards the other person, society, in general, whatever. Like, is it like this abundance, loving energy? Or are you making decisions out of scarcity, fear, you know, like, and those are very different energies. And so this is the energy I'm getting. I'm receiving both of these energies from my family. And it's very confusing at first until she explained this, where it was like, you know, initially it was just like, I love you, open arms, like abundance. Yeah, we want to hang out. Yeah, you can come stay with us. Yes, yes, yes. And then the next day, fear. No, you know, like I can't see you. It's it's bad, blah, 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 you know. And I'm just here like as this beacon of light, just showing unconditional love. Like I'm here, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. And, you know, so yesterday, um, I just hit this moment because we have, you know, all these cousins in, in Portland area, my mom and my grandparents, my mom's side are all currently right now, all excited to see me. Uh, and I just, I, I just don't think I can handle anymore right now. Like, um, you know, the whole opportunity for growth for me is to stay in my center and to be able to allow this unconditional love to come through me and like beam out of me. In order for that to happen, I have to stay grounded and like, aligned and all of these things are like it's like there's also other things that happened yesterday like I connected with this beautiful man at Burning Man and we had this love story and then like we never got each other's contact very Burning Man story and um you know like never saw each other again and I've been thinking about him a lot and I was in Nevada City where he lives now and then suddenly like yesterday at the end of the day he like messages me and he like found me online and he's like super excited and so it was like this positive thing and then you know <laughs> and then I got like all these other messages from friends that wanted to catch up and I just like I hit this point where I was like I cannot I can't even process anything anymore so um, I opened my phone and I was just looking at Google Maps like we were driving, you know, to, in the middle of Oregon. And then I see this town, it's Ashland. And it's like so many people of my friends are like, yeah, Ashland's this place. It's like this energetic portal. Some people jokingly call it like At- Atl- Ashlantis, like Atlantis kind of. So I'm here now. We're going to go explore the town now after I finish this podcast. And what I decided to do is um, one of my best friends in the whole world, Michaela, I've known her. She's my first friend that I made after I was kicked out of the religion when I was 24 in New York City. We both had just started living in New York City and we met in like a group therapy thing and we both were like sitting there. We were the first, it was, it was a very funny story of how we met because we were in this like, it was like adult I think it was like codependence anonymous or something. We just needed help. And so we both randomly were there synchronistically and everyone else is is in like deep Brooklyn and everyone else is like Hasidic Jewish women (laughs) wearing wigs and just like very Jewish. And we were just sitting there looking at each other like, where, what are we doing here? And so we went outside. I just remember finding her outside, just sitting on the sidewalk. And I was like, do you want to get a coffee? And she's like, yes. And that was almost nine years ago. And we've been in many countries together. She's come and visited me a couple times in Thailand, three, at least three times in Thailand. We've hung out in Portugal, Vietnam, many other countries. And her family has a Christmas tree farm uh, near Seattle. And her sisters are turning it into a permaculture project, which is just so cool. 
I love her. Um, and she's like the safe haven for me. So she's like, so basically I decided I'm going to skip. We're literally going to just drive through Portland today, but it's another two hours to Michaela's house. And I just need to, I just need to rest for a couple days. Also, all of this happened right after Burning Man. And most people spend an entire week after Burning Man just decompressing because like, I was trying to talk to my friend Josh about it on the phone last night. I was like, just like, I could talk for hours about all the experiences I've had at Burning Man. And I'm stacking on top of that right now, all this very stressful stuff with my family. And my body is having a very strong reaction. It's just like, it's full. Like it's not even like negative or positive. It's just like, <laughs> it's like the computer. That's like the disc is full. Like I no longer can process, no longer can save anything else into this body until we have some space. And so when I was talking to Daria about all this yesterday, she was like, why don't you create a new story for your body that it's safe and that no matter what you're going through right now, it can be fun and that you can have a good time. And so I was like, yeah, what does that mean for me? So one, it was stopping, not just keep driving. So we stopped here in Ashland and got a really nice hotel room and just like had the whole place to myself um, and just you know, had a really nice time, like resting last night, talking on the phone with friends and recharging, eating blueberries. I love blueberries. When my mom was pregnant with me. She couldn't stop eating blueberries and I'm just addicted to them. And in, in Asia, we only can get frozen blueberries. So I've been eating a lot of fresh blueberries. So I was like sitting in my robe, in my bed by myself, eating blueberries, watching TV and calling my friends. And that felt really nice in my body last night. And then today we're going to explore the town and then go to Washington and just be on the farm for a couple of days and then basically recharge, recalibrate, take some time to integrate all of these experiences and emotions and things in my body and like connect to soul family that is nourishing and supportive and like has my back and you know like the kind of stand meets the standard of how I choose to be treated and then come back to Portland, which is like just another two hours south and, and deal with and meet my cousins that are excited to see me. And then, you know, uh, see my mom and my grandparents on my mom's side. And so that I'm sharing this with you because, you know, when you're in the middle of doing hard stuff, even if you're doing like spiritual work, like I consider the spiritual work with my family. It's really important to honor the human experience that we're having and to not push yourself because sometimes people get like really excited to heal their, themselves or their family or whatever and they go too fast. They go too fast for what their body can handle. And so I really invite you, I invite you to be gentle with your body and to go only as slow as it can or as fast as it can handle. Um... And to have as much fun as possible and to lean on um, like family, like the supportive, nourishing family, whether it's blood family or soul family, chosen family, your friends, and to allow yourself to be seen in that and to be vulnerable. Like when I was on the phone with Josh last night, I was talking about everything that's going on. And he asked me, he said, you know, when you're going through something hard, is it possible for you, like basically how available are you to actually speak up that you're feeling vulnerable and I was like "Ooh, that's a really hard one because growing up it wasn't really safe to be vulnerable in my family and so when even when I'm going through a hard time I can like on the surface act like I'm fine I'm fine and I really can I can like shut down my emotions and get through which is not actually nice to my body uh, because then I just hit this point of like overload you know so um it's an exercise for me to like, yeah, it took like an hour on this call with Josh where I finally started crying and was just like, yeah, I have so much love to give my family. And um, the illustration, one time I was in Mushrooms and I was like explaining it to, to my boyfriend at the time. I was like, I just feel like I have, so pumpkin pie is my favorite kind of pie. <laughs> I was like, I feel like I have this pumpkin pie and it's like a cold winter night and I don't know, like a holiday or something. And I'm like trying to go into my family's house and they keep opening the door and then like closing the door on me. And like this pie is like this unconditional love that I just want to share with them, you know? And I'm just standing in the cold, like trying to give them this pie and they just like do not want to receive it or like are not capable of receiving it or whatever whatever 
And that's kind of how I felt yesterday. And I was like, you know, I give so much love to the world and I have so much unconditional love and impact and like, you know, like power. I'm like here to empower all of us and to activate all of us to allow ourselves to feel the source connection, to feel divinely guided and to understand that we're so loved by the universe and so protected and just we're here to really enjoy this human experience. Like, wow so grateful to be alive and to feel all of these things the good the bad the ugly the everything in between and also you know my soul chose to be born into this family lineage like this physical blood family so like why are they not letting me give them this love you know like this was like what I was saying I was like I can go do the hardest things in the world but like what I really care about is like being with my family like if, and he was like yeah well maybe that's why this is happening because Someone was saying to me the other day that like some of the people who've gotten the farthest in life have, have had the most amount of trauma. And I found that to be really interesting <laughs> because it is kind of true for me. Like because of this stuff with my family, like nothing else seems like that big of a deal to me, you know, because like the thing that I actually care about and the thing that's the hardest for me, I'm already facing right now with my family. So like going and putting myself out on a podcast or talking to some famous people or, you know, like doing these big projects that, you know, would probably scare other people. I'm like, let's go, let's do this. Because the amount of um, pain my soul and my body have already gone through, it makes everything else seem less scary. I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, but I think also a reaction to everything with my family is because they are not wanting, they're choosing to not receive this like unconditional love from me. I'm still giving it to them, but they're not like fully allowing themselves to receive it. It's like, I just have this all in my hands and I'm like, who, who wants this? You know, I got, I have this, I need to share this. It has like generated this energy and it's going to pour out somewhere. And I feel that this is like, it's like generating all of this beautiful love and I'm sharing this with the collective now. Like, I'm like, okay, if they don't want it, then who wants this? You know, like, let's go, let's build this new earth together. Let's create a community of people that's based on spirituality and our connection to source, not religion, not shame, not guilt, but just like pure energetic connection that we are all in this together. And like, let's build our eco villages together and let's raise our kids together. And that's like, do this together because together it matters because together it's more fun you know <sighs> so yeah that's where I'm at <laughs> in the void of the unknown um if you have any of your own stories around this I'd be I would love to hear you can write in the comments on YouTube um or send me a message I just feel like a lot of us uh think that we are alone in dealing with our family dysfunction and we don't realize that it's kind of a communal thing it's a collective thing that we're all dealing with because we are cleaning up like generations of family trauma right now because like we're one of the first generations that's willing to face all of it consciously and it's a lot it's a lot <laughs> and you're doing great if you're willing to face this and I'm really proud of you and please keep going because it matters. Every single time one of us switches on and like gets conscious, it's like, you know, I just think of like a video game. So sometimes I use this analogy like of a video game where, you know, the computer generated players. So, so, so basically like if you're in the video game and you're interacting with stuff that is created by the video game, like these people that are not real, right? And they call them NPCs, non-playing characters. And I really feel that uh, as each of us um, become conscious and allow ourselves to choose to create a life based on sovereignty and based on our, our choosing to like create our own reality and clean up our family lineage, we're like going from this NPC, this non-playing character, um, to like, ding, like switching on to like allowing ourselves to be fully alive in this timeline and have our soul fully activated and like, yeah, be our authentic self. Um, and it's really beautiful because I see so many people like switching on recently and coming back to the States, like a lot more people are switched on than I realized. And it's so beautiful. 
and everyone's doing it in their own way and that's the thing is it doesn't need to follow a religion it doesn't need to follow a specific spiritual path it's just like are you connected are you getting your own downloads are you you know fully your authentic self are you vibing are you having a good time are you playing the game of life in a way that is fun for you and where you feel connected to yourself to the earth to each other to source that's all that matters we're here for all of it okay i'm gonna go and explore this town and figure out what spiritual things it has here for me and i'm wishing you all lots of love <sighs> and I will keep you updated on my journey. I am in the deep void of the unknown. And also I know that I am very connected and loved. And I want you to know that you are too. Okay, bye.